मेरी हिंदी बहुत ही कमजोर है आफ्टर सच एलोक्वेंस आई एम गोइंग टू स्टिक टू हिंदी सॉरी इंग्लिश um welcome again to the teaching i want to say a few words about how the teaching has gone so far uh this is the 14th uh in this series of teachings for those who are joining us today this series of teachings is called what the nation really needs to know india the nation and nationalism and it began on february 17th with the talk by gopal guru entitled what is the nation so this is the 14th such teaching which has been live streamed as you all know and watched worldwide we had intended actually to bring this teaching to an end perhaps today but by popular demand it has been extended for a full extra week we had intended that these reflections on nationalism which have enriched and complicated the concept will not only enlighten but will challenge the existing ideas of nationalism among the students and faculty attending and hearing them we realize that we need a thick not a thin description a complex not a simple history a robust not a weak definition of this term we also realize that we cannot leave it to political scientists or historians alone and that's why we have invited perspectives from economics from law literature the performative arts and from science two days ago apurvanand made the distinction between worship of the country and love of country and why the latter is a much more difficult an absorbing task and i hope that difficulty is what we are taking on in this teaching here today in these teachings we are extending the work that teachers do beyond the walls of the classroom beyond the boundaries of disciplines beyond the certainties of specific methods and through this we are once more demonstrating what the space of the university is and what the space of the university should be I think we have achieved all this and more and that is why today's teaching which should have been the last in this effort will be the beginning of another week of such reflections Today we are fortunate to have with us two former teachers of the JNU Center for Historical Studies Romila Thapar and Harbans Mukhia who have seen this place from its early seeding and have jointly participated in many public interventions and that's why i thought it was appropriate that they talk to us together here today i have had the good fortune of being taught by both of them as an ma student in the early 1980s and we were very troublesome students even then and i welcome them very warmly to uh, this uh, event today i'm not going to stand on formality and do a formal introduction to them but i just want to say a few words about the topic which is uh, the uh, the topic of history and nationalism then and now happy is the nation without a history now were these wise words actually said by caesar bacharia in the 18th century even if they were not they are not only a very important reminder of the impossibility of nationalism without history as ej hobsbawm reminded us a nation without a past is a contradiction in terms indian nationalism was no exception to this rule of history making and historical myth making <coughs> it is a task from which there is no rest as nivedita menon reminded us in the series because the nation is a daily plebiscite who better than romila thapar and uh, harbans mukhia can tell us about history and nationalism then and now than these experts from two time periods early india and medieval india thank you I'd like to begin um, by thanking you, thanking all of you for being here, 
thanking the people that invited me to come and speak, to speak. Uh, that's going to be difficult. Anyway, I'll try. Um, I'm laying stress on this because I regard myself, together with a few others, as being what I call the dinosaurs of JNU. <laughs> we were here at the start. I joined in November 1970. And we were here at the start and we were here to build a university. And our main concern at that time, we went up and down on this, we brainstormed, we did all kinds of discussions and debates and so on. Our main concerns were two, that it must have a high academic quality so that it will be recognized as a place for students to come and learn in the proper sense. And secondly, that it must be a place where there is free discussion and debate. And over the years, one has been watching, one has been working in JNU, one has been watching JNU, one has been watching the developments. And in the last one month or so, I must confess that I was deeply depressed after what happened on the 9th of February, because I thought this is an attempt to break JNU. I feel much, much better now. I feel much better now. And I just want to say thank you for being JNU. Now, having said that, done my duty as a dinosaur, let me now come to something much more uh, topical, which is the connection between history and nationalism. Um, this is a connection, which is a very close connection. I have to. Um, and it's a particularly close connection because a nationalism has a lot to do with the question of understanding your society and finding your identity as a member of that society. And the question of identity is, in fact, extremely important. I'd forgotten that. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm has a rather interesting description of the relationship between history and nationalism. He states that history is to nationalism what the poppy is to the opium addict. What does he mean by that? What he means is that history is one source and history is also something that gives the nation an identity. And it's these two questions that I'm going to be playing around with this evening. Nationalism emerges as a concept or an idea in modern times as a response to historical changes. It does not exist in pre-modern societies. This I am very, very emphatic about. So we don't look for nationalism in the centuries gone long past. We look for it when society changes to the point where it is required. When it emerged in Europe in the 17th century, it was a time of emerging capitalism, expanding colonialism, the growth of the middle class, and the middle class aspiring to participating in government through democratic representative systems and has also tried to integrate small territories into larger territories. It brings together many groups, and ideally it encourages a secular identity to ensure inclusive unity. Defined by a new sense of social awareness and identity, there is in nationalism inevitably an inclusive inclusive and overarching identity. History is essential to a national ideology, but it has to be a shared history that binds people together. <coughs> history has to be the bond. 
It cannot be a history dominated by only one identity because nationalism does not exist on only one identity. It is all inclusive. National history, of course, has its moments of joy. It goes, takes, goes to the past and it has a golden age, a utopian age. Uh, which is the exemplar and is very often the kind of society that is held forward as being the ideal society. Not realizing, of course, that whatever society you take as a utopia from the past belongs to the past. It belongs to the history of the past. But what we are dealing with today is the history of the present, which is a rather different history from the history of the past. National identity supersedes existing identities. If it is inclusive, it's generally much healthier. But if it pretends to be exclusive, then it can be quite disastrous. And we've had an example of that, a very severe example of exclusive nationalism in the case of Germany in the 30s, with all this talk about the purity of the Aryan race and the destruction of the Jewish, Jewish population as a result. But where it has been inclusive, even if scattered, it has had quite a positive effect. For example, the kind of nationalism that we never refer to, but which is very pertinent, I think, to the Indian situation too, African nationalism. Negritude, the way it was developed in the Caribbean by Aimé Césaire and Leopold Senghor, which brought together an African consciousness that stretched from Africa to the Caribbean to North America. It was an inclusive nationalism of a very extraordinary kind. And I think we would do well to study some of that. But let me turn to the Indian situation now. The evolution of nationalist ideas in India was tied to colonialism. And therefore, the influence of the colonial interpretation of Indian history is there in all kinds of nationalism to a lesser or a greater degree. In pre-colonial times, there were multiple identities of caste, language, religious sects, and regions. Political ambitions that caused constant wars, uh, kept changing the borders of kingdoms, patterns of caste that differed from the north to the south, from the east to the west, throughout the regions and gave regions a certain kind of identity. And religious identities, which I would like to argue, were not based on monolithic religions, but on religious sects. And the religious sect is something to which we should give much more attention when we talk about the history of religion. In sum, we now recognize that diversity was characteristic of India. But we don't stop there. Because if you say diversity is characteristic, then the next question you have to ask is, how did diverse groups negotiate their space and their relationship? And that is terribly important. If you're talking about diversity, you must be aware of this kind of negotiation as well. The colonial reading of Indian history denied this the diversity. The first modern history of India was, of course, as is well known by James Mill, 1818, the history of British India, which had two main theses that have had a very important effect. One was periodization. Mill divided Indian history into three periods, the Hindu civilization, the Muslim civilization, and the British period. And this was based on just one feature the religion of the ruling dynasties, a feature which is really almost incidental to a lot of the historical activities that carried on during the centuries. <coughs> Nevertheless, that was a feature. History was seen then as the history of two nations, and they talked right through the 19th century. Colonial scholarship talked about the Hindu nation and the Muslim nation. There's some dis discussion on what the term nation meant then and what it mean means now, uh, but that apart. And they also said that these two nations were permanently hostile to each other. 
That was another given as well. And that it had required the intervention of the British to keep these hostilities quiet and to keep these two nations at peace with each other. There were no histories, of course, of India as a unified territory prior to colonial rule. And colonial histories, therefore, tried to tidy up this diversity, not by asking how the diversity is related to each other, but simply by projecting large groups of sects and large religions, monolithic religions. They really dramatize the importance of what they called the Hindu religion and the Muslim religion in terms of the confrontation of these two. The interpretation of Indian history then uh, became basic to what came to be called the two-nation theory that has been politically so, so influential and continues to be influential in some ideologies today. And from this perspective, Hindu-Muslim antagonism became axiomatic to Indian history. The period from AD 1000 onwards was treated largely in terms of discussing this antagonism. This was the basic idea of history. The two-nation theory was strengthened by the idea of majority communities and minority communities, and it divided Indians and encouraged Indians in thinking about their identity as distinct, consolidated, monolithic religious identities. This naturally supported colonial policy as well, and therefore was furthered by colonial scholarship. Nationalist historians writing substantially a century later, great stalwarts such as H.C. Rai Chaudhary, R.C. Majumdar, Neelakantha Shastri, and so on, challenged some colonial theories like Oriental despotism, but curiously accepted the periodization. Hindu period, medieval was the old Muslim period, and modern was the old British period. So the labels were changed, but the divisions and the reasons for the divisions, the religion of the ruling dynasties, those reasons didn't come into play. That was one theory which one can lay at the feet of colonial scholarship very firmly. The other is a more complicated one, but nevertheless has its roots in colonial history. And that was what came to be called the theory of Aryan race, and later on it became to be called the Aryan question. In the mid-19th century, European philology became interested in Vedic Sanskrit and its links with Indo-European languages. And among these many scholars, Frederick Max Muller, for example, projected the idea, as did others too, he was not the only one, but he was very forthright in this, he projected the idea that the Vedic corpus authored by the Aryans was the foundation of Indian civilization. The history and origin of the Aryans and their innate superiority became an important aspect of colonial scholarship. It was popularized, interestingly, first by the theosophist, Colonel Olcott. He maintained that not only were the Aryans indigenous to India, but that they migrated westwards and civilized the, the Western world. This was very useful in projecting the idea that India has always had a singular history of which the most important history has been that of uh, the ancient Hindus. Various theories were put about about the origins of the Aryans. Max Muller said they came from Central Asia. Dayanand Saraswati preferred Tibet. Tilak, as we all know, was much more adventurous and suggested the Arctic regions. Um, when it became fashionable in the 1920s and 30s to talk about the Aryans being indigenous to India, it was little embarrassing to have Tilak going on talking about the Arctic Circle. And someone had the bright idea of saying that in those days, in Vedic times, the North Pole actually was located in Bihar. <laughs> 
Now, where was the need? Where was the need to project this indigenous descent of the Aryans? It was important, if you argue, that there was a direct link between them and the Hindus of generation after generation that followed to the present times. It was also interesting that some people, Max Muller on one side, Keshav Chandra Sen on the other side, argued that in fact the British were Aryans, the Indians, upper caste, were Aryans, and therefore they were all part of the same kinship. And they talked about parted cousins coming together. Uh, all of this was fine and went on in a very interesting way till unfortunately in the 1920s, unfortunately for them, a problem arose which was the discovery of the Indus Valley Civilization or the Harappa culture as it's called. This was prior to the Aryans and it was not Vedic. Therefore, it was the foundation. And this naturally created a problem to those who believe that in fact Vedic Aryanism is the foundation. So that's one reason why today people are busy shifting the dates of the Vedic corpus back to pre-Harappan times. 7,500, I'm told, is the latest date that's being suggested. Um, but the other problem is that the origin of the Harappans and the language that they used is unclear. The language is undeciphered, and we don't know where the Harappans came from. So it's now being argued that the Harappans were also Aryans. <laughs> so that you get a situation where everybody in the subcontinent from the year zero was Aryan. But anyway, there, there it goes on. Now, how do these kinds of ideas, how do these ideas and problems connect to the question of nationalism? By the late 19th century, there was an established middle class in India. The colonial economy was tied into British capitalism, and much of the middle class, largely upper caste, had emerged as professionals managing the administration of the colony and its colonial economy. The idea of nationalism began to emerge from this group. So once again, it is a particular historical situation in modern time that leads to the emergence of nationalist ideas. At first, the nationalists requested greater representation in governance, and then gradually, as we all know, it grew into a mass movement, and the mass movement then finally ended up by saying <coughs> that they demanded an independent nation, which is, of course, the logical outcome of certain types of nationalism. Anti-colonial nationalism then comes to be established and it endorses the idea of a nation saying that such a nation had to be a democracy with, secular, with a secular egalitarian society. The primary identity of this nationalism, anti-colonial nationalism, was Indian. The person, the citizen, was to be called an Indian. It had an overarching inclusive identity that incorporated people of all religions, castes, and languages on an equal basis with equal rights. And this is an important component of what was originally projected as secular, anti-colonial Indian nationalism. This was a new identity, obviously. And in some existing ways, um, it was seen as a new identity and was projected as that. But given the history that had been written by colonial scholarship and taught to the colonials by the colonizer, the fundamentals of, of which had not been fully challenged, there inevitably arose two other kinds of what some people call nationalisms and some people prefer to call communalisms, the Hindu and the Muslim. Both these endorsed the old British two-nation theory and each aimed at establishing two separate nations. Unlike anti-colonial secular nationalism that was inclusive of all, these communal ideologies excluded everybody except those
themselves of their own religion. They were not anti-colonial, they were simply hostile to each other. The two initial organizations were the Muslim League and the Hindu Mahasabha, and the Hindu Mahasabha gradually developed and was superseded by the RSS and by various other organizations of that kind. <clears throat> with its ideology, which has come to be called Hindutva. This movement has its own history. It took shape from the 1930s, reflecting some influences of Italian fascism. They were very close to, to Italian fascism. As with all nationalisms of any kind, it turned to history. But interestingly, it appropriated the two dominant colonial theories, the Aryan foundations of Indian civilization and the two-nation theory. These are now described as the indigenous history of India and are said to be the theories that have been cleansed of the cultural pollution of the Indian historians influenced by Western ideas. They are rooted in colonial theories, but that doesn't seem to bother them at all. The core of the ideology is the identity of the Hindu. <coughs> the Hindu is the one who can claim the territory of British India as the land of his ancestry, Pitribhumi, and the land of his religion, Punyabhumi. Muslims, Christians, Parsis are presumed to have come from outside this territory and there is, as their religion originated in other lands. Outside, and the territory is of course defined by British India. Therefore, because they come from outside and their religion comes from outside, they are foreigners. The Hindu, therefore, is the primary citizen. The true claimants to Indian civilizations can only be Hindus descended from the Aryans. And this is one reason why the Aryans have to be treated as indigenous to India, whether they were or not, because that also makes them the inheritors of the land. There are, however, glitches in this argument, and those of us who have pointed out the problems get our daily dose of abuse on the internet, and we are described as ignorant JNU professors, <laughs> even if in fact most of us are not of the JNU, but that doesn't matter. The history of the Aryans, as it stands today, on which so much of the ideology of Hindutva hinges, has become extremely complex now because it involves many disciplines. It involves linguistics, archaeology, hydrology, and most recently, genetics. People are going around taking DNA samples and arguing that they're getting samples of the Aryans. The questions we are now asking, we meaning we historians of a different ilk, the questions that we are now asking have moved far, far away from the basic question that they are asking, were the Aryans indigenous or foreign? We argue that cultures don't grow in isolation, so we need to know which other cultures coexisted and contributed to the cultural beginnings of Indian history and how did this cultural mixture, amalgam, juxtaposition evolve? Those are the questions we are asking. And then we come to the two-nation theory, taking history back to medieval times. This theory has been questioned in various ways by modern historians. And the history of religion, uh, many of us argue, covers a range of religious sects and social groups with a variety of relationships between them. And those relationships resulted in some degrees of conflict or accommodation. But the history of religion has to be seen as that history, not the history of monolithic groups in, conflict, um, in, in uh, confrontation. It is commonly said, and I will only touch on this question marginally, because Professor Mukha asked 1,000 years, 
So the discussion was, who has the highest status among Brahmins? The learned Shrotri of Brahman or the temple ritual priest? Very fundamental question because it raises the issue of the form of worship and who is legitimizing what form of worship in this multiplicity of sects that are doing their own thing with their own forms of worship. There are striking compositions in this period. For example, the great Sayana, who writes a fascinating commentary on the Rig Ved, which is a very, very interesting uh, uh, insight into the medieval mind and how the medieval mind of the 14th century is looking back 3,000 years on the Rig Ved and giving a commentary verse by verse of the text. Or their philosophy compendia, uh, philo philosophical schools that are uh, discussed. Many, many texts, the most commonly used one being, of course, the Sarvadarshana Sangraha, where the Charvak philosophy constitutes the first chapter. The Charvak philosophy is the philosophy of materialism, discarded in many uh, other more elite uh, philosophical uh, text, but here it is discussed in full with the author saying, I don't agree with it. This is not my idea of good philosophy, but because it's being discussed, I am also discussing it in this, in this book. Which is interesting. Many texts on mathematics and astronomy are being written, and Indian astronomers and mathematicians, many of whom were Hindu, are praised, discussed, and quoted in texts from Baghdad. Did these mathematicians and astronomers on both sides know Sanskrit and Arabic? Otherwise, how could they have these discussions? How could they be quoting each other? They must have known it. What happened to that tradition? Why isn't it recorded? Why don't we know about that tradition? The shape and form taken by Hinduism, as we recognize, as we recognize it today, draws a lot from these thousand years. Bhakti sects become common all over northern India at this time. And the whole bhakti tradition of worship becomes an extremely important part of what we today call Hinduism. The Shakta Shakti worship expands. And the popular sects like the Nath Panthis are developing and growing and expanding everywhere. It's what I sometimes call the Guru Peer religion because it is the religion of the majority of the people who are going by what is being pre preached to them by the Gurus, the Peers, the Sants and the Babas. And that is really the religion that we should be looking at. We need to put these facts into a historical context and see them as part of a civilizational and historical process and not reduce them all the time to the confrontation between Hindus and Muslims. That's a non-starter in Indian history. That should be a non-starter because we have much more important things to investigate and, and to discuss. These were religious and cultural forms arising out of the characteristic feature of India at the time, even in the 1000, last 1,000 years. It hosted differences. It had an attitude to all kinds of differences. And these differences could either coexist or get amalgamated or create new forms or confront each other. So there was a range of choice in how sects and differences uh, were played out in the society of the time. And once again, we need to see the interactions of the various cultures and explain their mutations and be sensitive to the spaces that they created and observe the emergent identities that came out of them. This can be seen if we don't restrict the study of religion to texts alone, but also explore religions expressed in the oral traditions. Because do keep in mind that the majority, the vast majority of Indians in early times could not read. And the oral tradition was their source of belief and their source of social codes. 
Religion in pre-modern India, therefore, is for the historian an extremely challenging study, precisely because it is not a collection of monolithic religions confronting each other all the time, as we've been made to believe. It makes far more sense to see religion as it emerges from an array of religious sects that cover the range from the orthodox to the heterodox, and the sects make their own equations with each other, some friendly and some not so. The sect also, the religious sect, is linked to caste. And that has remained common to all religions in India. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by this. Arab traders came in large numbers and settled at the beginning of these 1,000 years, the early centuries, um, the second millennium AD. They came and settled uh, all down the west coast of India and established their own religious sects which were a combination, a mixture of Hindu and Muslim ideas and practices and so on. But each of them kept a distinct identity. And despite the fact that some of them had common Islamic elements, they kept their separateness very, very straight because they had correlated with different castes along these settlements. You don't, for example, today get a Gujarati Bohora rushing to marry a Malayali Mapila. And yet their origins are at the same date, the procedures are the same, and so on. The other striking feature is that all formal religions in India, religions of the book, of the text, and so on, discriminate against the Dalits, even those that belong to their own religion. Muslims and Christians outside India do not observe this segregation, but in India they do. One cannot study any religion in pre-modern India without investigating its links with caste. Those that were always marginalized, such as the Adi Adivasis and the Dalits, and many lower castes, where they were not converted to the former religions, had their own forms of belief and worship. And these are rarely commented upon in the histories of religion. Sources from early times, and this I'm my, my last, last point, why am I insisting on the religious sect being so important? Sources from early times seldom mention monolithic forms of religion. From Ashoka to Al-Biruni, 1500 years, references to dharma are almost invariably made in the form of references to two streams, Brahman and Shraman. Ashoka has Brahmanam, Shamanam. Megasthenes visiting India as a Greek visitor talks about the Brahmanes and the Sadmanes and so on. The first lot, the Brahmans, believed in the gods, in the divine sanction of the Vedic corpus, and the immortality of the soul. The Shramanas rejected all this, therefore they were called by the Brahmans as <coughs> Nastikas, non-believers, and later on, of course, they were called Pashandas, frauds. Each of these two dharmas hosted a range of sects, covering variants in belief and worship. Some were accommodating, some were confrontational. There are references, for example, to Shaiva sects being more often than, than others hostile to the Jains and the Buddhists, which was not unusual because, after all, people had different views. But interestingly, uh, Patanjali, the great grammarian of the early centuries AD, refers to the two dharmas, the Brahmanas and the Shramanas. And he adds that the relationship of the two can be compared to that of the snake and the mongoose. I think that's very telling. I would like to <coughs> conclude then with a couple of statements based on what I have said. At the time of independence and soon after, and none of you were born, 
We had no problems in defining nationalism and the definition was accepted. Today, efforts are being made to obfuscate it. Nationalism draws on reliable history and not on just anyone's fantasy about the past. Critical inquiry, as we all know, Critical inquiry, as we all know, is essential to the advancing of knowledge. It is expected of a university to critically inquire into what may publicly be claimed as knowledge. Nationalism draws on the identity of the citizen. This is preeminent. But it cannot be the identity claimed as superior by any single group. It has to include the equality of all and the equal rights of citizens. Incisive debates on this are part of the nationalist enterprise, which is an ongoing enterprise of the relationship between history and nationalism. And universities are obvious places for such debates. We in India have had a head start with the constitution that we have, and with our commitment to making the nation a secular democracy. This is what we are committed to as Indians, and what we were committed to when we became independent. And this commitment has to continue as a hallmark of our nationalism. मैम बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद इस लिहाज से जो तथाकथित देशभक्त हैं वो हमसे भारत माता की जय नहीं भारत के पिता की जय कहवाते हैं लेकिन वो लोग भारत माता की जय बोलते हैं उनको अपना ही इतिहास नहीं पता है खैर इसीलिए उनका जो सावरकर जी हैं वो कहते हैं फादरलैंड लेकिन स्लोगन भारत माता की जय लगाते हैं खैर मैं उस डिबेट में नहीं जाऊँगा बिना समय को बर्बाद किए हुए मैं चाहूँगा कि अगले वक्ता के तौर पर प्रोफेसर हरवंस मुखिया अपनी बात रखें और एक सूचना है कि तीस्ता सी तलवार भी आ रही हैं इन दो स्पीकर के बाद वो भी अपनी बात आप लोगों के बीच रखें मैं राजस्थ हैं वेल फ्रेंड्स माय यंग फ्रेंड्स वी केम हियर इन द बिगनिंग ऑफ जे एंड यू एंड देवर इट वाज वेरी वेरी एक्साइटिंग जब टू � because call from JNU, therefore, uh, one, one, one response immediately. I, uh, I, uh, when I was invited here, I began to wonder, you know, uh, lots of doctors, medical doctors around the world, institutions around the world, they are uh, doing very expensive research on uh, age fighting, what is called age fighting, uh, no, aging, age, anti aging process, you know, on finding an anti aging treatment. I think the best anti aging treatment is to come to JNU, inter <laughs> interact with the students of JNU, and nothing sheds away more decades from your, from your age than interaction with JNU students. It's so wonderful. It's so wonderful because. As Romila was uh, pointing out, uh, JNU was meant to be a different university. It was meant to be a different university because it was meant to, as any university should be, but JNU above all, was meant to question received wisdom, was to question, was to question what were established truths. Uh, questioning does not mean demolishing. Questioning does not mean questioning uh, Nationalism does not mean becoming anti-national. Questioning patriotism does not mean you become anti you become anti-patriot. Questioning means trying to understand phenomena. Trying to when you question nationalism, you question in order to understand the no, the, the phenomenon of nationalism. And the phenomenon of nationalism is not just one phenomenon. It's a very very diverse phenomena. It's a whole host of phenomena. Whether it is nationalism or patriotism.
Buddhism or any ism that you that you can talk of. You know, it's a whole host of phenomena, phenomena, and therefore understanding that, questioning that, is trying to understand those phenomena, and that's why JNU is 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 JNU promotes so much of questioning. Uh, I please forgive me for a for a for a little biogra autobiographical note. I. I think it was 30th or 31st of January 2004, uh, my last working day in JNU, and I was to give my last lecture to my class. Uh, after teaching history for 44 years, 11 years in Delhi University and 33 in JNU, I, I still, believe me, I still prepared my last lecture for three hours before I delivered it, you know, because I knew in JNU, you can't, you just can't go, I've taught it for 40, 40 years, 44 years, you know. In JNU, you can't go to class without preparing your lecture, you know. So that's JNU, that's, that's JNU, you know. Uh, that's why we love JNU so much, you know. Now, uh, I'll take off uh, from a point that Romila had touched upon, which is very crucial. Uh, by the way, before I go, go to that, uh, Fernand Brodel is one of the finest historians in the world in the 20th century. And one of his last books is called Identity of France in two volumes. That book he opens by asking in the 20th century, he asks, is France one country? Is France one society? Is France one nation? He asks that and he says, France wasn't one country, France wasn't one nation, France wasn't one society in the beginning of the, until the beginning of the 20th century. It began to evolve as a society and as a nation only after the coming of radio and, and television when French became the language of all of France and French uh, nationalism began to be accepted in all of France. And yet, even in that uh, 20th century, there is still a region called Brit Britain uh, which resents being called French. Those they, they are French, obviously, they speak French. They resent being called French, just as the Scots resent being called British uh, or English. So that nationalism is a, is a concept which is still evolving, even the most advanced nations. You know, it's not merely, it's not, it's not a settled question in any country, in any region of the world. And therefore, it has to be understood, it has to be questioned, it has to be queried all the time. That's our duty to do so. But I'll come back to James Mill, uh, which Romila had, to, whom Romila had referred to. James Mill, as she said, and as we all know, in 1818, divided Indian history into three periods, Hindu period, Muslim period, British periods. Prior to that, uh, there was no periodization in Indian history. Uh, the difference between past and present was known naturally. It's known in every society. The difference between, uh, between what has happened, the change that has occurred from the past to the present, that was obviously known. But there was no notion of ancient or medieval, ancient or medieval, or modern or whatever, whatever. There was no notion, not only in India, but anywhere else, except in Europe. In Europe, this tripartite division, which is, which is so familiar now, had come only at the end of the 17th century, in 1688 to be exact. Uh, and then it spread to the rest of the world in the 19th century and early 20th century. In India, it's used for the first time, ancient, medieval, and modern in 1903. But it was used it was in, a, in a different form, Hindu, Muslim, and British period. What is the, what is the implication of this tripartite division, Hindu, Muslim, and British? The implication is that, you know, James Mill was a utilitarian. Uh, he was against all religions. He had very, very great contempt for Islam, but he had even greater contempt for Hinduism. Uh, he, realized, he, he believed that you know modern states should function with modern institutions, modern uh, industry, etc., etc. So he had contempt for uh, uh, any earlier forms of uh, state functioning, and therefore he declared earlier forms were Hindu and Muslim. You know, that is to say, nothing else mattered earlier prior to the coming of British uh, British rule. Nothing else mattered. All that mattered was whether the religion of the ruler is Hindu or Muslim. That's all. Therefore, uh, James Mill essentialized one notion, namely that of 
religion, religious identity, one notion. You know, uh, essentialized it. Uh, Kanaya Kumar the other day very, very rightly reminded us JNU people we use too much of jargon, which is not intelligible. But essentialized is not much of a jargon. But even so, let me, let me nonetheless, uh, taking advice from him, uh, explain to you a little bit about what does essentialize mean. Essentialize means. Kanaya Kumar stands up and says, my name is Kanaya Kumar. So we immediately uh, understand that he is a Hindu, he is a boy, male, uh, that he is also a, 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 a Marxist by uh, persuasion, that he is an activist, that he comes from a certain background, that he, he has certain aspirations. All that becomes irrelevant. All that stand is that he is a Hindu boy. That's about all. Nothing else matters. You know. uh, uh, our friend Umar Khalid has been declaring from house tops that he is he is an atheist. Uh, in fact, the other day his sister, when he was charged with being sympathetic to Jaisha Muhammad, his sister said on TV, he doesn't bother even about Muhammad himself, not to speak of Jaisha Muhammad. <laughs> And yet he is a Muslim because his name is Muslim. You know that's what essentialization means. You know so reducing all the all of us have many 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 different aspects to our existence. You know uh, we are male male we are female we are uh, urban we are rural we are poor we are rich we are educated uneducated this that and that are all kinds of all kinds of facets uh, we are we are we are a bun we are an ensemble of all kinds of facets our existence is not just one identity you know it is many many identities you know but all of these identities are reduced to just one namely the religion and that to the religion of the ruler just one and therefore hindu and muslim period means Nothing else mattered in the Hindu period except the religion of the ruler. He was he was not he was a, he was a Hindu ruler. That he was a good ruler or a bad ruler, efficient ruler, inefficient ruler. If did he conquer territories? Didn't conquer territories? Did he administer well? Didn't nothing matters, you know. So also Muslim rule. So he essentialized the study of history uh, in 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 these terms of Hindu and Muslim pre-British history, and therefore justification of uh, colonialism. That colonialism brought modernity, modern institutions, etc., to to India. Now, uh, it's not as if uh, the 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 the, uh, the notion of Hindu and Muslim was not known earlier. Obviously, it was known earlier. You know, uh, uh, Professor Amila Thapar has written that excellent book, and he has also she's also talked about it a little uh, for a while now, uh, passed before us, where she shows. The enormous range of perceptions of the past in early India. Enormous range. There is not one perception of the past. History has has, has seen in many, many different ways in, in, in early India. Let me talk of medieval India. In medieval India, uh, history takes a different form from early India. Uh, it, 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 has, it has a very strong Islamic color to it. In the sense that, as one uh, historian, Arab historian, has written Tarikh, Tarikh, uh, Tarikh Khalidi, uh, Islam brought not only brought a new religion to the world, but in, but also a new concept of history. The Arab world uh, was not illiterate. There was poetry, there was arithmetic, there was uh, genealogy, etc., etc. But there was no concept of history there, as as we or as anybody understood it. So Islam brought a new concept of history there. And from there it spread to the to wherever Islam spread. And medieval India also, uh, the historians were writing, were imbued with this idea of Islam as an aspect of history writing. And therefore the era that they used mostly, not all of them, who mostly used was the Hijri era. Uh, Islamic history era. So Islam is very is Islam is present in history writing in medieval India. But is history writing a branch of theology in medieval India? No, it is not a branch of Islamic theology. Why not? When is history a branch of theology? Let me illustrate this uh, first and then I'll say why medieval Indian history writing is not a branch of theology. In medieval Europe, 
where the historians were all uh, church fathers. That was the only literate class in medieval Europe. The rulers were actually generally illiterate, you know, first generation, second. It's from the third generation onwards that the ruler began to read and write, you know. But the literate class was really the church fathers. They were the only historians, therefore. Uh, being church fathers, not only did they live in church, uh, precincts of the church and so on and so forth, but their mindset, their thinking is naturally entirely shaped by their religion. In their religion, uh, God is omnipresent, God is omniscient, God knows everything. Whatever has happened in the past, whatever is happening today, what is going to happen tomorrow, God knows all this. You know. In God's mind, everything is, everything is clear. Past, present and future is clear. We don't know, but God knows. And therefore, what's happening uh, in history is a manifestation of God's will, divine will. God has willed this this war to take place, this flood to take place, this earthquake to take place, this fellow to accede to the throne, etc. It's God's will which is manifesting itself in historical events. Regional history within regions is dynastic history, within dynastic it's regional history, each reign is a single unit and when you come to the current sultan, each event it becomes an I'm sorry, each year becomes a single unit, you know. It's a fantastic reduction from dynastic history to regnal history to annual history, you know. It's a, it's a wonderful reduction. And the second aspect is chronology. They are very strict about chronology. Now, uh, but each event is a single individual event. No event is related to any other event. Even their narration is like this. In this year, this event took place. They would describe that event. And another event that took place was this. They would describe that event. There is no connection between one and another event. Each event is a single individual event. Uh, which is contrary to the, the European history where everything is part of a pattern. There is no pattern in history. And the second is that in Euro Europe, medieval Europe, uh, history is, as I uh, emphasized again and again, is a manifestation, manifestation of di divine will, God's will. In medieval India, history is a manifestation of the will of the ruler, or will, or at the best, at best, nature of the ruler. You know, uh, individual will, human will, not divine will. And therefore, you have things like Alauddin Khalji was a very strong ruler and therefore he conquered lots of territory. Firoz Shah Tughlaq was a very weak ruler, he never conquered any territory. Akbar was a very liberal, so therefore he followed a very liberal religious policy. Aurangzeb was very, etc., etc. You know, this you must have in your undergraduate studies studied uh, all this weak ruler and strong ruler, uh, liberal ruler, and all of this comes from medieval Indian uh, historiography, you know, the notion of rulers being, rulers will or rulers nature being the determining element of historical. So, so the events of a reign, uh, of any ruler's reign are the manifestation of the ruler's personality or ruler's nature, not God's nature. In that sense, uh, medieval Indian historiography is very fundamentally different from uh, medieval European historiography and therefore it is not a branch of theology, notwithstanding the influence, the, 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 the use of Hijri era and the, and the fact that it owes its origin to Islam in Arabia. Now, <coughs> once you have uh, human nature as the as the determining element of the events that you are describing, then you have a whole range of natures. You know, not no two persons have the same nature. Obviously, they don't. I just mentioned to you. You know, Alauddin Khalji is very strong ruler. Firoz Shah Tughlaq is a very weak ruler. You have all kinds of a, a historian of the 14th century, Yaudin Barni, even as a theory, he says every man's nature uh, every man's nature comprises contradictory qualities. It's only a balanced mixture of these uh, contradictory qualities that leads to success, and imbalanced mixture leads to failure. And in fact, he says even God's nature con consists of contradictory, contradictory qualities, and so on and so forth. And you, those of you remember your uh, chapter on Muhammad bin Tughlaq, Muhammad bin Tughlaq uh, was a mixture of contradictory qualities. That's why he failed as a ruler, you know. So, 
So, but, but you have other rulers, you know, who are very strong, who are very, very uh, one or the other, you know. So, everyone's nature is different. And therefore, you have a range of explanations which are given to you by medieval Indian historians. What James Mill does is, he reduces all of this range of explanations to one single explanation. The fact that the ruler is a Muslim is all, period. You know, that's all that, 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 needs to be, that needs to be understood. Nothing else needs to be understood. No variation, no change, no, no uh, range, nothing, you know. The, the, that, the ruler is a Hindu or a Muslim, that's all, you know. And therefore, we began to adopt that periodization and that mode of history writing after in the 19th century and good, good part of the 20th century. We adopted that, you know. How, uh, what, what uh, it does is, I'll give you two examples. What this reduction to, uh, to uh, essentialization does is, uh, Annette S. Beveridge uh, uh, translated Babur Nama into English. Excellent translation, absolutely fabulous translation. Now it has been superseded by another translator, Taxon, but until for about a hundred years, this was more than hundred years, it was a standard translation and good translation, very good translation. In the Babur Nama, Babur mentions he went to Ayodhya. He says that I did these administrative arrangements there, etc., etc. He says I also went to Shikar in Ayodhya. <clears throat> he doesn't mention any Ram temple. He doesn't mention Ram, doesn't mention any temple, doesn't mention demolition of any temple, doesn't mention any uh, construction of a Babri Masjid uh, by him or ordering the construction of Babri Masjid or any Masjid by him. I mean, there's, no, there's no reference to Ram and Ram, Ram Temple, Ram, Ram Janam Sana, Ram, etc., etc. However, in the translation, there is an appendix appended by Mrs. Beveridge, the translator. Uh, appendix, I forget its number. Anyway, it says, in this year, Babar went to Ayodhya. There, he must have come across a very old sacred temple of the Hindus. And as a faithful, for, I'm just paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact words, but this is roughly that, quite exact, more or less nearly that, uh, trans, uh, the, the text. That as a faithful follower of the faith, as a follower of the faith that he belonged to, he must have destroyed that temple, you know. <laughs> now, this is what follows from essentialization, you know. Because Babur is a Muslim, therefore he must have done all this, you know. That he did all that, there is no evidence that he showed, that even she shows, you know. But he must have done all that. You know? But let me take up a bigger example than this. You see, uh, <clears throat> as a as, as a essentially Muslim ruler or rulers, uh, what would be their primary duty in when they are ruling over India, such a vast territory as India with a massive non-Muslim population? Their primary duty would be two, duties would be two and interrelated. First would, would, duty would be to to convert these non-Muslims to Islam, that would be that would be expected of a very faithful follower of Islam, Muslim, essential Muslim, etc., etc. You know, and B to impose uh, the only one jurisprudence over the entire population, namely the Sharia. That's required naturally. You know, it follows from that. You know. Now, let us look at the. Let us look at the process of conversions in Islam. I don't want to go into many details, but very briefly. Let's look at the question of conversions in Islam. Let me say that the Muslim population in the Indian subcontinent before partition, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh together, is the largest population in the whole world. It, now it is uh, divided because it's divided, so it's Indian, Indonesia is the largest. But if you put it together, it's the largest Muslim population in the whole world, isn't it? And yet there is not a single book 
on how did these conversions take place. The largest population and we don't know how do these conversions take place in India. Why is there is no book? You know, there is no book because, not because historians haven't thought of writing a book on this, you know. There is no book because there is no data available, available for writing a book. Why is there no data available for this? I'll tell you why is there is no data available for this. You see, uh, two or three, uh, two or three uh, data to, to begin with. Uh, in 1941, which is the last census uh, before India's independence, and partition, uh, uh, Muslims comprise 24 uh, point some seven percent, or let's say 25 percent of the population. One in every four is, four Indians is a Muslim. Uh, in 1830s, we don't have census data before that, unfortunately. But whatever little data we have, we have. I'll, I'll cite that to you. In 1830s, uh, one bishop, Bishop Heber, came to India. As a, as, a, as a traveler, and he mentions that one in every six is an Indian. Therefore, between 1830s and 1941, in the next 100 years, there was a 50% rise of Muslim population from 16% one, from one, from to 25% in those 100 years. And these 100 years were when the British were ruling here, not the Muslims were ruling here. Uh, that's one. Second, uh, look at the distribution of Muslim population in the subcontinent, the demography of Muslim population in the subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh together. The largest, hugest majority of the Muslims are where? Up in Kashmir Valley, 98-99%, up in what is now Pakistan, in Bangladesh, and South India in, in Malabar area of Kerala. Isn't it? Uh, that's where the Muslim majority population rests. Uh, Malabar, the the the, the so-called Muslim uh, rulers never reached there. Their 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 regime, their territory stopped short of Kerala, uh, Andhra, uh, Karnataka. That's where that's the maximum they reached. So Kerala, they never reached. So they have no role play, to play in the conversion of people in, uh, of Malayalis to Islam. Kashmir had turned to uh, Islam long before Akbar invaded Kashmir uh, in the 16th century, 1573, I think. Uh, uh, and Kashmir had uh, turned to, there are two books on Kashmir. Uh, uh, both of them suggest that a major force of conversion to Islam there was Nand Rishi who is, the Nand Rishi is a Sanskrit word, but he's actually this uh, this uh, saint, Sufi saint, who is buried in Char Charare Sharif. He's known as Nand Rishi. His persuasiveness is one of the main reasons, not the state, but his persuasion is one of the main reasons. What is now Pakistan? The west part of Pakistan, uh, the frontier area is always has always been a disturbed area. This was constantly under attack from the Mongols, from here, from there, from the tribes, and so on and so forth. You know, and the and the rule uh, rule of the so-called Muslim rulers. We don't we historians don't use these terms anymore. James Mill did, but we don't. But nonetheless, I'm using it to make my point. The rule of the Muslim rulers in India in in, in that part was always shaky, always never very firm. It was always episodic. And in what is now East Bengal, there were local Muslim dynasties, but no, no, virtually no rule, uh, no, no, no rule from uh, Agra or Delhi or whatever. It was always contested, you know, always. So therefore, uh, and in the mainland of the Muslim rule, Bihar, UP, Delhi, East Punjab, the Muslim population Never exceed in in if it was about 16 percent, 15, 16 percent in 1941, it must have been much lower than that. Obviously earlier, seven, eight percent, ten percent, twelve percent, whatever. In the heartland of the Muslim empire, the Muslim population, where they were so, the argument that the Muslim state was converting people to Islam falls flat on its face on its face if you look at the demographic distribution of the Muslim population in India. I'm not suggesting that the state had no hand in it. The state also had had it hand uh, had its hand in it. In fact, <laughs> uh, you uh, my 
Muslim friends may not be very pleased to hear this, but nonetheless, as a historian, let me nonetheless say that the state converted people to Islam as a kind of punishment. You know? uh, that is to say, if you commit a crime against the state, and the you know only only uh, punishment for crime is you know beheading. Uh, but the state, the ruler is kind or ruler has considered past services or usefulness of the man. He says, okay, I'll not kill you, but if you convert to Islam, you know. <laughs> so it's a second level punishment being given to them, you know. Uh, uh, so also, by the way, Hajj, you know, sending people to Hajj is the second large, biggest, biggest crime, biggest punishment you can give them. You know? Whenever the state is unhappy with some, but some Muslim uh, noble, they send him to Hajj, you know, to Hajj. But anyway, so that you know, uh, so it's not as if state did not have a hand in it, you know. Uh, but uh, the point I'm making is, and the point that many historians have made is that it's the uh, from which I started. Why is there is no book? The, the, there is no book because there is no data, and there is no data because. The process of conversion is a so extremely lengthy, it extends over centuries, two or three centuries, and B, it, ha it occurs over in the hands of, at the hands of so many agencies that there is not one agency which is responsible for, you know, if there was one agency, let the, let, let's say the state, if they convert lakhs of people here or thousands of people there, some historian or the other, uh, great, his, great theological historians like uh, the Mullah. Uh, there is a historian of Akbar called Mullah Abdul Qadir Badaini. He is a Mullah himself. He was a Mullah. He was the Imam of Wednesday prayers in Akbar's court. He was a very, uh, very uh, what shall I say, zealous uh, Mullah himself. He writes his book Muntakhab Tawarikh. He would have said, "What a great ruler he was!" So and so was he converted thousands of kafirs to Islam. Not a word in his three volumes. You know. There are other historians uh, like Bhim Sen, Hindu historians like Bhim Sen or Sudan Rai Bhandari and so on and so forth. Not a word about conversions or in them. You know. Nobody is right. Why are they not writing? Because the state is converting some individual there, some individual there, etc., etc. State is not engaging in a massive conversion. Which which would have got into record either by way of praise or by way of condemnation. You know, it would have got into record, but it doesn't. You know, so, so therefore, uh, therefore, there is no data. You know, uh, there is no data because it's happening so slowly, so slowly over long stretches of time and through so many different agencies and for so many different reasons, so many different reasons that uh, that they, that it has. Does, it's not a it's not a one go affair, you know, where you where 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 it will get into record. You know, it doesn't get into record. That's why the historians don't uh, can't write a book on that that very major theme of history, namely conversion of masses. So that so so uh, this is uh, this is the history of uh, the so-called Muslim rule in India. But what is a picture you get from James Mills? Essentialization of Muslims. Muslims are Muslims, so they would be there. That's what they would be doing all the time. They would be converting people all the time, you know. Uh, so you get a distorted picture of history. You get you 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 lose a whole range of explanations of history. You get one explanation, which also is a false explanation, which also is historically, in terms of historical data, is a is an incorrect. Uh, in, 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 uh, inference. You know. Therefore, you get a uh, get a you, you get a bad kind of history following from this. You know, uh, singular kind of history. You know, just one monolithic kind of history, singular kind of history. Now, this lasted till about the 1950s. Uh, uh, this kind of history. I'm I unfortunately or which, which, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, this is also the kind of division that our historians, Indian historians, had adopted. They also adopted this, as Romila has already pointed out, adopted this. But you know, things began to change in the late 1950s, early 60s. Uh, I happen to be one of those, belong to that fortunate generation, I think, where I was a student at Delhi University, undergraduate and postgraduate in the second half of the 1950s, uh, as BA and MA. 
uh, I studied that kind of history that I'm now describing, uh, Hindu and Muslim and so on and so forth. It was called medieval India, but actually it was Hindu and Muslim and so on and so forth, that kind of history. Suddenly there was a wave of change, you know. Suddenly you stop, uh, you, 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 you started talking of uh, class rather than community. You know, you start, community as the category of analysis was central to uh, that kind of history that was suddenly replaced by a new category called class, which had nothing to do with, you don't have Hindu peasantry and Muslim peasantry and so on and so forth, you know, you have peasantry, you see, uh, and therefore a new explanation, D.D. Koshambi, Irfan Habib, R.S. Sharmat gave, a, started a new kind of completely landscape, historical landscape changed, you know, up in the 19, late 1950s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. And that colonial kind of colonial legacy that we had inherited, that began to give way one after another. In the 1980s, late 1980s, 90s, a fabulous range of themes, a fascinating range of themes is emerging, you know, absolutely breathtaking range of themes has, is emerging, you know, uh, themes like history of the notions of time, for example, history of the notions of space, for example, history of interpersonal relationships, for example, history of the household, for example, history of gender, history of ecology, history of history of uh, the natures of states, and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, a, 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 new, a, a fascinating new world has opened from the 90, late 1980s, 90s onwards, and then in the 21st century, where, where uh, quite clearly old texts, uh, chronicles and texts and so on, so they wouldn't do, they can't give you the data, you know, you have to go diff to different sources altogether. New sources began to open apart from texts and uh, uh, chronicles and uh, archaeology, new texts, uh, folklore, uh, uh, folk songs, vernacular literature. There are fabulous books recently on vernacular literature as history, not as sources of history, but they also encompass a concept of history, a notion of history in themselves, you know. Marvelous books are being written recently. So a new world is opening up, you know. So we have left, we have left colonial history far, far behind in the last 50 years. Very far behind. Very, very far behind. Uh, completely abrogated. And I must say that the British historians themselves, under the influence of historians of India, they themselves have given up this kind of colonial kind of uh, historical writing, you know, they are themselves giving it up very fast, you know. But, that's the question, but the RSS and the BJP wants to, wants us to give up all this, forget about all, all this, go back to James Mill, go back to history as Hindu and Muslim, that's all, no other, nothing else matters except Hindu and Muslim, that's all, the, 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 nature, the religion of the ruler is all that matters. You know? And therefore, Aurangzeb was a bad ruler because it, you ask uh, what, is a, what, what, what do you know of Aurangzeb? Aurangzeb was a bad ruler. He oppressed the Hindus. What, what did so and so? He was, a, he was this ruler, that ruler. You, know, you, you go, go back to James Mill kind of essentialized identity of Hindu and Muslim. They want us to go back to that kind of history. You know? Do you want to go back to that kind of history? No. No. That's why you are under attack. attack. That's why you are under attack. Thank you, sir.